evening, everybody. Nice to see people here tonight. And um, for those that don't know who I am, I'll just quickly introduce myself. Um, so I'm Professor Pauline Walsh, and I'm Pro Vice Chancellor and Executive Dean for the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. It's a mouthful, isn't it? You know. But, uh, and um, so uh, I'm really delighted to welcome everybody to what's the second inaugural for the faculty um, for this year. Um, we had one last night, so it's really nice to see different types of um, experiences and work being shared with people. Um, and, and that's really what an inaugural is about. It's about celebrating the work of the individual professor, acknowledging what they've done and actually getting to know a little bit about what they've done. And, and that's why I love coming to them, actually, because you sit there and you think, oh, I didn't know that. And oh, how interesting. And oh, I like that, you know. So, so they're a really enjoyable um, event. And, and I think uh, we all get different things from them. But I think everybody goes away with something. So this evening, I'm delighted to say that we've got Professor John Berkeley who's a professor in exercise rehabilitation, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about him. Um, so John was born and raised in Canada. On leaving high school in 1981, he began his lifelong career in helping people become more active in exercise and sport by working as a community tennis coach, which also paid for his university. In 1986, he graduated from the University of British Columbia Vancouver, Canada, with a combined honours degree in physical education and business studies. While at UBC, he maintained his work as a tennis coach and gaining experience as a sports science lab assistant and strength and conditioning coach with Tennis Canada's National Elite Athlete Development Programme. In September 1986, John came to the UK to pursue a master's degree in sports science at Loughborough University focusing on exercise physiology and biomechanics. His ambition was to return to Canada to start his own business as a running and tennis performance sports scientist. However, after graduating from Loughborough in 1987, he decided to stay in England for what he thought would be six months, <laughs> taking a job as a sports scientist at a fitness centre in Shrewsbury, lovely place. Um, early in 1988, having only been in Shrewsbury a couple of months, he had met some physios interested in sport and exercise, and by September 1988, they had set up their own fitness and physio business, known as the Lifestyle Fitness and Physio Centre in Shrewsbury. Within less than 12 months, he was taken on as a casual lecturer at the physio school in Oswestry, now at Keele, where lecturers Marilyn Andrews and Jane Holmes liked the concept of sports science and physios working together in offering patients a more complete package of short to longer term prevention and rehabilitation. By 1996, John had a permanent position as a part-time research fellow stroke lecturer at Keele, and he embarked on some research into cardiac rehabilitation with the North Staffordshire Hospital, now University Hospitals of North Midlands. He enrolled for his PhD at Keele in 1999 and completed in 2003. In 2006, John was recruited by the University of Chester to lead up their PG programme on cardiovascular health and rehabilitation, which included teaching in the Middle East and India. Between 2009 and 2011, John served as the president of the British Association for Cardiac Rehabilitation, which then led him to working with his counterparts in Canada and America, where in 2012 they had established the International Council of Cardiovascular Prevention and Rehabilitation, for which John was the founding chair. This has now grown to a membership of 45 country associations of cardiac rehabilitation from around the world and is an associate group of the World Heart Federation. His international work and research collaborations led him in 2017 to becoming a member of the World Health Organisational Policy Panel on Heart Disease and Rehabilitation. As will be highlighted tonight, amongst numerous research publications, John has co-authored edited three exercise science and rehabilitation textbooks 
and published over 15 chapters in a variety of other textbooks and national professional guidelines, including the International Olympic Committee's Manual of Sports Cardiology. In November 2021, John returned to Kiel after 15 years at the University of Chester and is post as professor in the School of Allied Health Professions, which is to lead on education and research developments around active living and cardiorespiratory health and rehabilitation. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor John Buckley up to the stage to give his inaugural lecture Prevention, Rehabilitation, Physical Activity and Exercise, what do we really mean by these terms? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Pauline, for the kind introduction and... Um, and thanks to you all for coming here. It's great. I can't see any of you with all the lights, so I can pretend that there's, there's lots of people. I think the last time I stood on this stage giving a presentation was in 2002. The room was about 300 physiotherapists and exercise scientists gathered here for a, a meeting, and I had a treadmill there, and we did a, an exercise test uh, on somebody as part of a workshop in here, so I think that's the last time. But the, I don't notice the treadmill there. But anyways, um, thank you all for coming. And um, I guess I better look at the clock here. And uh, we'll, we'll get going. Um, so um, we're going to cover prevention, rehabilitation, physical activity, and exercise. And, and look, I've taken a keen interest in, in people's perceptions. Um, I've my PhD was in perceptions of effort, but people's perceptions of what these words mean uh, is, is been quite a, a, a bugbear of mine because we, we teach people about these things and we have perception ourselves and the people receiving our education have per, um, perceptions of what these things mean. We talk to clinicians and they have their perceptions of what these things mean and then the p clinicians talk to patients and clients and they have they all have, so you can see Chinese whispers, and, and so that understanding if we're wanting to get people more active, and in fact, we might be just talking at cross purposes in people's understanding. So um, that's mainly, the, mainly the, the thrust of this evening, but to intertwine that with some um, research and some, some stories. So um, just to put it into context, one of my bugbears is um, I often hear people giving a lecture and they say, what's the difference between physical activity and exercise? And I'm sitting there thinking, there isn't any difference. Physical activity is the, the thing. We just need people to be more physically active. It doesn't really matter how you energize your muscles to be active. It's all physical activity. And there's a certain amount of it that you have to do in order to gain some benefit for your health or even gain some benefit for your fitness. And we divide it into three sort of three levels, light intensity, which is what I'm doing at the moment, just standing on my feet. We classify that as light intensity. And in fact, if we look at a public health problem, it is light intensity activity that we have taken out of people's daily lives since the Industrial Revolution, which is the biggest uh, problem in terms of health. And yet we try and um, remediate the world by giving them structured exercise, which they have to get motivated and dressed up to do. So that's what we class, usually classify moderate activity and then the vigorous activity. If, you're, if you can't catch your breath and you're working really hard and you like to beast yourself, that's what we consider as vigorous. But if we look at the total amount of physical activity and exercise that people do in a, in a day or, or not, it breaks broken down into spontaneous activity, so uh, how much spontaneous activity happens in your day-to-day -day life. So that might include, um, we're not allowed to have bins in our offices anymore. We have to take things. So that's spontaneous activity, because without knowing it, you have to find a bin to put your coffee cup in um, and go down to the corridor. So that's a really good thing. Um, school or occupational activity, um, and occupational, as we, we've removed things, domestic activity, and then finally leisure time activity, exercise, and sport. But if you told somebody or asked them how physically active they are, 
they would probably just focus on their leisure time activity and exercise and sport, which only makes up about a half to 2% of their total amount of activity. So what are we going to change? Are we going to change the world by that, or do we change the world by the other things? So that's what we're going to look at tonight. Um, but as part of this, obviously, acknowledge some, and gratitude those who have shares in this professorship. Nobody owns a professorship. It probably is well. I was talking to the students today about shares and ownership of business as well. There's lots of people who have ownership of this thing that you've um, uh, awarded us with as it called a professorship. Share with some academic stories, and then perhaps um, make you think about your own physical activity. If, if that's one thing that happens tonight, then I feel I've achieved something. So objectives, two, show you some nice photos. Um, highlight and acknowledge the key people that have invested in the, the shares of this um, accolade, and then discuss and debate the topics I've just uh, raised with you. Okay, so the prime acknowledgements, no doubt the most important people in the world to you. Um, a person that is... Not here tonight, because uh, she left the house at 6.30 this morning. She's supposed to finish work at half past four, but she probably will not be finished work by the time my lecture is finished. Fiona, my wife, who's a hematology nurse specialist in Shrewsbury, um, and uh, you see traveling is a big part. So she, she likes the bit of my work where I get to travel. Um, and these are my parents. and. Uh, they, this is a picture in Ethiopia in 1991 where they were working on a Canadian government project for bringing clean water to Ethiopians. Um, my mother was a public health nurse, my father a civil engineer, and activity and being active and healthy living is, was a thing that we grew up with in our house. Um, and these are pictures of them in their sports and activities in the 40s. Uh, so, um, in terms of just looking back the last 40 years of when I started out as a tennis coach, um, and um, what would some, if somebody said, well, what um, are the rewards? The rewards are captured in a few pictures, getting invited to Buckingham Palace afternoon tea, uh, getting invited to the president's lunch at Wimbledon, getting invited to sit in the royal box and have lunch in the executive suite at Wembley, to watch Shrewsbury Town in the final, and obviously lots of trips around the world to, to talk about exercise, just like I'm doing now. I'm um, at Singapore um, at the Asian Pacific um, Conference for Cardiac Rehabilitation. So that's probably the reward, um, and that's the most important thing um, about, about the thing. Um, so uh, most people think about professors, the realities of being a professor. Well, there's Indiana Jones, and there's Brian Cox, and, and you think, well, you tell the public you're a professor, I think they're expecting that. Um, but, you know, you can't, not everybody can be like that, but you can hang around with some cool professors. So this is Alice Roberts, um, and I met her at, a, at the Cheltenham Science Festival when I was doing a presentation with Dr. Michael Mosley on standing desks, and he introduced me to her, and she, the first thing she said is, can you give me a contact for a standing desk, because I need one at Birmingham University. And she handed me her mobile telephone number. So I thought, that was great. I've got Alice Roberts' phone number. Um, and so when it came time, she was doing a, a tour. And I asked, would she come and talk to our staff about translating education, academic information into education? And so this was an afternoon in Shrewsbury called Tea with Alice with our staff at Shrewsbury. Um, so uh, then it's, you think about justifying your existence. And this is my mother, late mother-in-law when I got my PhD in 2003. And she said, so what exactly are you a doctor of? So, and then that's a, quite a try thing to explain. Um, so my wife loves Woody Allen. And um, she reminds me that those who can't do teach and those who can't teach teach gym. So that's me. So, um, and as I said, I have done work with the Association of Chartered Physiotherapists in Cardiac Rehabilitation since 1999. And each year, or each time they have an update of their standards, i am been fortunate enough to contribute to them. So in 2008, I was made an honorary physio from them, and they gave me a physiotherapy cardigan. Because I used to tease them about physiotherapists, and I said, you can spot a physiotherapist a mile away. They have got a cardigan, and they walk around with their arms like this, 
and they don't walk very briskly. And I'm sure the nurses just love that story. So anyways, I thought, oh, this is, this is an accolade. I've got a physio cardigan. What an accolade. Until I saw the back of it. <laughs> um, so anyways, I did find a home for, um, for being a professor of gym. And there's gymprofessors.com, so I think that'll, that'll do. Um, so all professors are not classed equally. We need to respect that. Um, and there's various gradings of them. And even in this room here, there's professors. Um, and I sort of feel like I'm down there with uh, Ronnie Corbett. And uh, you, know, you can make your way up. And then obviously, Einstein doesn't answer to anybody in terms of having a role model or anything like that. But you know, that, this is, we, still, we do need to remind ourselves of, of um, these titles and often um, uh, what people perceive uh, is different than the reality. So anyways, let's, let's think about people that have helped get me here. Um, and three people at University of British Columbia. And that is the view that I had from my halls of residence window, <laughs> uh, looking out over English Bay. And in the wintertime, you can see the snow on the hills, and we were only 40 minutes away from skiing um, in, in Vancouver. Anyway, so don't ask the question, what's he doing here? But three people, Ted Rhodes, Gordon Robertson, and Patricia Vratinsky were lecturers that inspired me, Ted, about exercise physiology. Gordon Robertson was a biomechanist, um, and Patricia Vratinsky was a specialist in public health um, and, and physical activity. And when I came to Loughborough, Professor Clyde Williams, um, he is um, well known because the bill, he's not even dead yet, and he has a building at the Loughborough University called the Prof Clyde Williams Building. He was the first professor of sports science in the UK. Um, we only had 20 of us on the program in 1986. So I learned sports physiology from him. Adrian Hardman was the person who got me interested in physiology related to cardiovascular disease. David Kerwin as a biomechanist, and Rod Thorpe was a, a, a sort of a, a sports coach um, a specialist. So those people in, inspired me and, and sort of provided the groundwork for the same stuff that I do now that I did how many ever years ago that was. So we, in 1988, then I set up business with these two physiotherapists, Christine and Alan. And in fact, um, although Lifestyle Fitness, the fitness center has had to close down now as a result of um, COVID, the physiotherapy side of the business is still going. It still has a contract with four uh, that started in 1989, four GPs practices, NHS get physiotherapy, um, and uh, Alan is keeping managing that going. And this is the other picture there is the the Cardiac Rehabilitation and Exercise for Health Center at the uh, Royal Shrewsbury Hospital, which we set up and ran for 10 years. So that's where we sort of cut my teeth on practice. And all of the research questions that I'm still having now, I can still harp them back to the days, those 20 odd years of, of working with uh, people on the front line as a PE teacher for older people. Uh, this was our staff, we made up physios and fitness and professionals and exercise scientists. Um, working together as a, as a multidisciplinary team. That is Matthew Pinsent, four times gold medalist in the rowing. He did come and give a talk, a public talk that we sponsored. Um, but you know, he's not, he wasn't one of our clients, but anyways, um, he did come and talk. So um, uh, that's the, the best picture I've got of the, the staff that uh, we, we had. So uh, as he said, 1989, uh, January 1989, we had two new customers at Lifestyle Fitness, Marilyn Andrews and Jane Holmes um, came in to get fit. Jane had, uh, they were lecturing at Oswald Street Physiotherapy School. Jane had um, sprained her ankle really badly on, the, on one of the hills on, on the Boxing Day, on, on the Boxing Day dash um, and wanted to continue keeping fit, so she came into the gym. Um, and they quickly thought this business of physiotherapists and, and sport and exercise scientists working together was a good idea. So that was the start of that. And then, we, the, as we know, the school moved here in 94. I was on the, on the back of the van for that, that job, um, and uh, with Marilyn and Jane. 
And obviously, we, everybody knows Julius, who was the first professor appointed here soon after that. And because I was starting to get into thinking about doing a bit of research, he was the, the main man for supervising um, that. And uh, it was great to have him see me through my PhD. You might notice Robin there. She's your external examiner for uh, the MSI, I think, now. Uh, Robin was a young physics student and very keen on this exercise stuff with us. Um, and then about 1999 was, the, was a key turning point for me in terms of the academic career. But firstly, my dear mother passed away uh, of eight years of Alzheimer's at the age of 72. But um, anyways, an inspiration for the public health side came from her. And, um, and Jane and I and Gareth, who had, has done some lecturing for you, wrote a textbook exercise on prescription the BACR, the Cardiac Rehabilitation Association, we, we set up one of the regional training centers for the BACPR here at Kiel, was, a, was the Midlands Re Regional Center for the Exercise Instructor Qualification. Um, I, because I was starting on my PhD in two, uh, 1999, one of the areas I was looking at is neuromuscular diseases, and that was at Oswestry Street with Dr. Quinn Livin. And I got my first publication in, in, in terms of cardiac rehabilitation in medicine, science, and sports and exercise. And at the time, and still now, it's one of the highest regarded journals for sport and exercise science and sports medicine. It's the journal of the American College of Sports Medicine. So, and that was due to the, the, the collaborations with um, John Davis, the cardiologist, and Terry, who is running cardiac rehab here at, at North Staffs. And we were exercising patients soon after their myocardial infarctions. Now, it's the norm that they get started in two weeks, but back in 1996, exercising patients two weeks after their heart attack, when they had spent a week in hospital already, because they didn't get chucked down after two days like they do now, um, we were exercising them, and everybody was is horrified at us exercising these patients who had, had a heart attack only two weeks ago, and they were in the gym. So that was sort of a, the feature of... Of, of developing some confidence about the value and benefits of exercise for those people. Now, this textbook seemed to find its way into the um, National Quality Assurance Framework for Exercise Referral Standards um, of the NHS. Um, and as a result, I was invited to be on the panel for that and, and developing the standards for fitness professionals to become accredited in that area. My research was in the area of then for the PhD in ratings of perceived exhaustion, or the Borg scale, and this is Professor Gunnar Borg, uh, who invented that, and he is actually the most cited author in the world of sports medicine and exercise science, because if you've ever seen anything where they've done an exercise test, they will say participants um, had a rating of perceived exertion using the Borg scale, and there's the citation. So that was Professor Borg, and I actually got to go to Stockholm to have a day's tutorial with him in his, in his house. Um, and his wife had, gave me a nice lunch, and, we had to, it was, and I took me into his basement of all his publications. So um, this was a workshop organized by my, uh, my external supervisor, Roger Eston, who worked with Julius and I. And this was in Bangor. And eventually, I got to do a, a study with him. And the participants I used for this study were, were at Lifestyle Fitness. Um, but part of that, we also worked with England's blind soccer team. Five-a-side football, there's a bell in the ball, there's a sighted goalkeeper. This is, the, this is where my office is now. And we had an exercise lab dedicated that Marilyn said, that area is yours, John, that's an exercise lab. It's now offices where people sit. Well, we have standing desks in them. Um, and so these are rating of perceived exertion scales in Braille. So we had... Um, and, uh, and validated those. So in terms of the McArdle's disease research as part of the PhD, there was three publications that came along with that, and including a, a Cochrane re review. Um, it was a great Cochrane review because there were no studies. <laughs> so it looks really good on the cover, but when you open it up, there's no meta-analysis or anything because what we said is there are no studies that made it into the selection criteria for this. There needs to be research done into McArdle's disease. So, um, uh, and this was then, uh, things got better. We then got PRAC2 downstairs as a dedicated exercise area. And we had 
students, we had staff, that's Richard, and we had a visit from, um, from um, Richard Hammond from Top Gear, who was allowed to park his car there, and the parking permit people didn't come by and do anything because he was Richard Hammond. But he was filming a show called Should I Worry About Exercise? And we used the students as part of a, a, a small study. Um, and I remember Anne asking me, did I have ethical approval for this? He did. So, and I said, but the BBC wants to start filming tomorrow. So I think we got, a th we got an ethics application through in the afternoon. Um, I wouldn't like to see the quality of that ethics application, but it was just exercising physiotherapy students. So um, 2006, moved to Chester to lead up this, and this is the Asian Heart Institute. This was our first cohort of postgraduate certificate um, master's students in cardiovascular health and rehab at the Asian Heart Institute, and Dr. Rajesh contracted the local preventive cardiologist who was there, who became, who's become a close friend. Um, and we did the PG cert there, and then if they wanted to do the whole master's, they could come to England to finish that off. So, and in fact, some of them just came for another three modules, and then they went back to, the, back to India to do their master's degree. So it was a quite a nice um, relay and a cheaper way to do it for them because they didn't have to worry about um, living there. But Kevin Sykes, it was the one who was instrumental in, in, in organizing these opportunities for me. Um, and... Um, uh, so that was, that was the next 15 years until last November. But in that 15 years, um, I was part of the BACPR, and there, were, there was a um, national standards. We got published in Heart, and I also had the opportunity to be a part of the BCS's cardio, sports cardiology group because the Olympics were coming in 2012. And that's behind the desk there is Dr. Sanjay Sharma, um, he's the medical director of the London Marathon, and he's got ECGs in front of him because we've got an Olympic gold medalist on the rowing machine, and we've got a cardiomyopathy patient doing a full maximal exercise test on the exercise bike, and we were comparing theirs, and on the big screens we had there was their, their data coming up for a crowd of 200 cardiologists. Um, I was also invited to... Whitehall to have a meeting with a small group with the chief medical officer in that year, and we were looking at, she had published the standards of physical activity guidance for the country the year before, but she says, how do we get the message out to um, make this thing work? So as part of a group with that. And then, as I said, this um, international a group of cardiac rehabilitation from Canada, the United States, and us here in the UK formed the ICCPR, um, and we wrote a, a charter and had that published, and this was the launch of it in Vancouver in 2011. Uh, we got to travel to China, and you can see my friend Ajish from India then became part of this. Um, and in this is the, our meeting in Mexico in 2016, um, and there, we were up to 27 associations by then. And this where there was the Mexico de Declaration for Circulatory Health. And because I was the chair, I got to be the signatory for the cardiac rehab world on this World Heart Federation Declaration. So there's the, the map of uh, the, the um, 20, uh, 45 associations. And now we had a, a meeting two weeks ago, and the total was 45 associations from around the world. OK. So probably in the last few years has been, if you want to call it self-actualization, when you get invited to write a chapter for the IOC and you get invited to the World Health Organization, I think it's probably time. You probably want to just say, that's good. Um, I'll, I'll stop. But I have to still take home some money. Um, so I'm not stopping. Um, because these are all very, very nice things, but for some reason they don't pay any money. <laughs> In fact, you have to pay your own way to go to Geneva to go to World Health Organization meeting. But I guess everybody wants to be part of it, so they're quite happy to do that. So this is the uh, headquarters of the WHO. And when I got to the meeting, I was sitting around, and I realized I was the only voice. There was 200 people in that room, and I was the single voice for cardiac rehabilitation. And Sally Singh from Leicester, she was the single voice for pulmonary rehabilitation. So we sat next to us. So I hadn't, re hadn't quite realized that, um, that you were on the spot for that. Um, and our group has then published various things to try and develop cardiac rehabilitation around the world um, with various uh, certification programs. Obviously, the impacts of COVID 
on cardiac rehabilitation around the world um, and various publications about developing um, processes for getting people more physically active in low to middle income countries. So we're here now, 2021, and these are the people who've decided to take me on. So um, there could be some regret there, but thank you very much for taking me on or taking me back. And I'm very much looking forward to you know, working with, these, with the, this team of people in terms of the areas of, of research. So that's end of part one. Part two is a little shorter, but it's time for a break, so you better stand up and shake your legs and have a bit of a breather. So you got... <laughs> now, normally I would say you're gonna have to stay standing up, but because you're, if, unless you're in the back row, uh, I guess you could see that, but anyways, if you wanted to continue standing up for the rest of this lecture, um, please move to the side, but it'll be interesting from a behavioral perspective, how many of you will sit down? Okay, so anyways, if you are gonna stand, you have to move to the side though. Yeah. <laughs> okay, see? Okay. Anyways, um, in the past, I would force you to stand up. So it's quite interesting because I'm going to talk about public health and primordial prevention. And the question is, why, is there a, why, do, why do we put seats in a lecture theater? It just seems to be the norm. Why? We, if you think about the old cathedrals, the big cathedrals in the world, they never had pews in them. The crowds from the, used to come in and, and join in, and there weren't any pews there. That's why they're so big, so you get lots of people in there. Football stadiums didn't ever have any seats, and people would be quite happily stand up for two and a half hours. Um, so it's quite interesting where we've got into this world where we seem to sit down. If there's a chair there, we'll use it. And so it's quite, uh, yeah. It should come with a health warning, like a pack of cigarettes, really. Um, OK, so um, let's look at these things. Let's reflect on looking forward and developing how we might develop education and research here in, at Kiel. In the, they call it the SAP. Now, I'm not, I'm not big on acronyms, so I'm, I'm more, hap, more than happy to say the School of Allied Health Professions. I'm quite happy with that. SAP just doesn't quite, you know, maybe we should Change the words around or something. It sounds cool. Um, and to say that we have a fledgling, fledgling program in rehabilitation exercise science, and to congratulate Sam Jones on this. In the last, he's not even been the program director for he's not even two years yet, and yet the program's completely been revamped and doubled the number of students attending the course, and it's it's really moving forward. Um, and so that's why we should look at these topics and. Continuing physiotherapy um, increasingly is always popping its head up in terms of being um, involved with health improvement and public health um, policy. Um, and it's, it's important that people with that strength of voice and recognition um, do understand the evidence and the science behind things. And um, we now know that Kiel is aiming to develop um, studies and research in sport and exercise science in the future, so that gets people like myself quite excited. Um, now we have a, in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Science, research theme called the, a FRET, and we do, do lots of fretting, um, but it stands for Faculty Research Theme, and the research theme held by the School of Allied Health Professions is called Prevention Performance and rehabilitation. So here we go back to our understanding of what these terms mean. And I'm gonna start with performance, because often people just think of performance and they think of sport. So we'll just start with that concept. So this was my first publication as for my undergraduate thesis on tennis elbow, and this was Canada's national coaching journal at the time. So um, that was my very first publication, 1985. Um, and it was about injury prevention and performance related to sport. Um, I took an interest, obviously the slides have been slightly, we had to get, use the right logo, so we just slight change in the format, but that's obviously Boris Becker. He's now infamous Boris Becker. But in 1985 and 1986, he, in 19, he was the first, the youngest person to win Wimbledon as a man, man at 17 years of age and the defining feature of him was his serve. So for those of us in tennis, he had changed the game. 
he was one of those turning points in Gabe where the serve became much, much more prominent because of his. And it wasn't by mistake because in Germany, um, they hold sports coaches and sports scientists on the same platform as doctors and lawyers and scientists. They put them up there um, and regard them as important people in society as opposed to how we treat our sports coaches in this country. Um, and so I, as a tennis coach at the time, I was very interested in the biomechanics of that, and that became the, the focus of my research project for my master's degree. And we got, got it published in the Journal of Ergonomics. Now, the reason why I've put some pictures up from th that publication on my thesis is that to produce the data and analyze the data and produce those pictures to calculate the forces um, and the energy that's going through the elbow and the shoulder joint took me three weeks. We can go into our prosthetics and orthotics laboratory now, turn the cameras on, get somebody to swing a tennis ball or something, and almost in real time, that information will be produced. So um, that's, that's the way things have advanced since 1986. Um, so we talk about performance, and obviously Andy Murray's been in the news with his metal hip um, and still performing at a high level. But if we look at sports performance, it's, um, it relies on seven components of physical performance, from coordination, the delivery of energy to the muscles, flexibility, endurance of the muscles, strength and power of the muscles, and, and strength and endurance and power of the cardiorespiratory system. That's the physical stuff. Managing all that is a, a, is a human being with, who needs to be motivated, needs to pace themselves, needs to deal with the stress and anxiety of the performance, uh, and obviously needs to manage pain. So we can find another person with a dicky hip. And if we want to get him going, now this chap's got, had lung resection, and he's got a, a hip replacement, and he's got a bit of heart failure. But the same science is applied to helping him perform in day-to-day -day life. So the concept of performance is about performing in life. Andy Murray's life is about performing as a tennis player. And this chap simply wants to perform in life so that he can have a quality of life that's socially engaging and rewarding. And the limitations he has are the exact same as Andy Murray. When he gets to the top of those stairs, he's on a puff like Andy Murray. His muscles in his joints ache just like Andy Murray's. And if we can get him a little bit fitter, he can do that more easily. Um, and he has to deal, has to motivate himself to do his exercise. He has to pace himself so he doesn't overtrain, so that he's not knackered for the next four days when he's feeling good and he's got to deal with the pain and, and, and worry about that. So it's exactly the same stuff. So when we talk about performance, we can put it into, the, into that context as well. Um, then we have performance at work, and this is a very interesting. I um, haven't met her yet, but on Teams, uh, Katie Green is re registered in our school for a prof doc. That's a prof prof professional doctorate. She's a physiotherapist at Rolls-Royce, and this is great. She's going to be supervised by a neurological physiotherapist, Allison, uh, musculoskeletal physiotherapist Dale and me, um, PE teacher. And we're going to um, you know, look at the effects of the ergonomics and of sedentary behavior and health and work performance in Rolls-Royce workers. So it's going to be an interesting, but again, it's about performance. It's all about performance. Um, so the background to my understanding of sedentary behavior was the topic of um, a BBC television program in 2013 and we published this paper. Now, it's not a fantastic study. It probably wouldn't get Jonathan and Julius's uh, stars for ref, refable papers, but it was the very first study um, on um, physical activity in the workplace using continuous glucose monitoring, where we were monitoring people's changes in their blood glucose on a continual basis, as opposed to finger pricks, and then putting on the dipstick and waiting for it to to come up. So that's probably why it got published and got recognized in the New England, not in, in the Washington Post and the, and the um, uh, Wall Street Journal. Um, 
And it was part of this episode of Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. So it was good fun working with um, those. So I even got a, my own. Um, so this is, you know, this is the stuff that the ref doesn't measure. You get your own cartoon in the Daily Mail. So I went to Australia, and David Dunstan, who's a leading physiologist in physical activity and health in Australia and in the world, he said, John, forget about the New England Journal of Medicine. You've, been, you've got your own cartoon in the in the Daily Mail, and you've been on BBC television. He says, that has far more impact than a publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. So um, that's how you become a professor at the University of Chester. Um, so we ha have more studies. This was Lizzie uh, Deary, who did um, further studies in this area of sedentary behavior. And, and we went into Virgin Media call centers, the DVLA call centers, Shropshire Council, and the Royal Shrewsbury Hospital looking at these parameters. Um, so we, uh, there's a group of us from around the world um, that produced this because there was a lot of sales going on in standing desks and all these wild claims about how beneficial they were. So we decided, well, let's at least give some guidance to the world about reducing sedentary behavior at work. We weren't, we were saying that the science isn't very well developed. We acknowledge that, but we thought it was better to to tell people with the, as best as we could, as opposed to um, furniture companies making claims that, that they couldn't substantiate. So this then brings us to that concept of primordial prevention and health promotion, primary prevention. So this is where we're coming up. Now this is, this is really interesting. This is a physical education syllabus from 1909. And it says, the conditions of modern civilization, this is 1909, with its crowded localities, confined spaces, and sedentary occupations, um, and the social circumstances and difficulties which restrict opportunities for natural, natural physical development, all require children and young people um, should receive physical training, not for the purpose of producing gymnasts, but to promote and encourage development of health. So, but what we have here is we have primordial prevention issues and primary prevention issues that we, that we confuse. Because we say getting children to do physical education will cover the ills of a sedentary lifestyle. Okay. So if we think about it, the natural, I told you about the chairs in this room. That's, that's the natural built environment that we force people to be sedentary against. And the, Human is designed or built to conserve energy. We're a hunter and gatherer. There's feast and famine. So we are fantastic at conserving energy, as many of you know, just after Christmas. We are brilliant at that. Um, we are built to go for long periods of time on our feet, and we can do it. It's not, not difficult and um, not to do vigorous stuff. And so what's happened is that if we really want to get back to preventing problems related to physical inactivity, perhaps we've got two options. We either reconstruct the environment, so let's take the chairs out of here, except for people who need a chair, um, and activity by stealth, or we try and get them to consciously change their behavior through structured exercise, which we call sport, exercise, leisure, all those things. Um, and the government publishes its recommendations on these, but again, all of these, if you look at these pictures, tells the person that, um, you know, that they need to consciously do something and change their behavior. Um, so the only one that gets close to that is carrying heavy shopping. Well, why don't you just carry your shopping instead of... So anyway, these are interesting things. So, and I remember, this was my dad at the age of 94. Um, he was getting less mobile, and he and he's an engineer, and he, thought it, he had thought it through. He said, he goes, to the soup, he goes to the supermarket and walks around the aisles for his exercise, orders his food, and he has a social experience, and then he would have them deliver it to his home, as opposed to sitting at home, which he could just picked up the phone and they would have delivered it. So he said, well, twice, three times a week, I will get my exercise, this is at 94 with his heart failure, walking up and down the aisles, and then they will deliver it to home so that he can walk home. He doesn't have to carry it. So those are the sorts of things that can be done um, in, in life. But 400 BC, 
<laughs> Hippocrates said it. He said, um, it appears to discern the power of various exercises, both natural, he meaning those things that occur naturally in active daily life, and artificial sport and recreation. And we are trying to prevent the ills of life around using sport and recreation. And we need to remember sport and recreation are psychosocial pursuits. We love them. I love to do it. Um, and it, it is a whole thing. It, but it's a cultural thing. It, it's, thing. it's part of our culture. It's like music. It's like um, um, dance. It's a performing art. Um, and so we've got those two aspects. Now, if we can get people to do sport and enjoy it, that's going to be beneficial for their health. So that's fantastic. We can't argue with that. But there are 70% of the population that aren't going to be interested in that. The other challenge is that the people who promote sport and give people guidance are sporty people. So people like us or me, I don't understand what it's like never to have been active. So how can I understand the psyche of a person in front of me who doesn't like this at all? OK, so I'm just going to move on. This is an article that just came out about the genetic influences. So if you're lazy and inactive, probably 50% of that you can blame on your genetics. That's what this says. OK, um, so working on a small MRC um, uh, research project, we never got, this was 2019, we never got to then take it to the next level because COVID came along. Um, but we were looking at people's attitudes and perceptions about becoming uh, less sedentary in the workplace. Now, there was our, our recommendations from the sedentary office, our expert statement, and then we got a, we got a rocket from the, this group of guys, and they, and they were basically um, knocking us down, saying, you guys are talking a load of rubbish, da 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 da, -da. you haven't got any science behind yet, yet, da 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 da. But what I noticed was these are both published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. The authors of the article that were criticizing us were on the editorial panel for the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which allowed our publication to be published. But not only that, this chap here, who was knocking us, was also one of our co-authors. So it's quite interesting, the game of academia. Um, and I think it's just people like to be heard. Um, and uh, maybe because they'd, we'd stolen a march on them about talking about this thing before they did. But anyways, um, finally then we're talking about the ultimate exercise coach potato. And this just, I try to use this to try and remind ourselves how important gravity is to our health. So this is Major Tim Peake. We know he's an astronaut. And as an astronaut on the uh, International Space Station, he does two hours of vigorous exercise, really vigorous exercise in 23 degrees heat every day. So in a week, that's 1,000 minutes of exercise. That's 10 times more than the chief medical officers recommend we do. So that's a high volume of exercise. But if he's not doing that, he is sedentary, completely sedentary, because there's nothing pulling on his bones because he's floating around in in microgravity, can't say zero G, it's got to be microgravity now, so I finally understood that. So um, as part of a trip I, need, I went to Florida to the universities, I had to go to NASA being a, a kid, and my brother is here tonight, um, he's a family member representing it, who's a space nut, he wanted to be the first Canadian astronaut, um, anyways, he became a pilot, so not far off that, but anyways, um, I got to meet an astronaut doctor as part of the trip. I paid the extra money for the day with an astronaut. And this is, guys, he's done seven, seven um, spacewalks. But these are, I looked up this, these studies, and es essentially it said for the guys who go up into space for six months on the space station, their muscle, bone, heart, lungs remained um, um, impaired six months after return to Earth's gravity. So they, they had significant reductions in muscle, bone, bone density, heart and lung function at six months, and it took them 21 months of rigorous exercise to regra regain their pre-space flight fitness. So here is they're doing this thousand minutes of exercise, hard exercise a week in space, but we see that even with that, they were losing an incredible amount of fitness and a lot almost two years of exercise to get back 
to that, just six months in space. So it does show you that just being on your feet and allowing gravity to do its business on your body has to be a good thing, and this is evidence for that. Um, so 70% of the UK sit for more than seven hours a day, including those who meet the physical activity guidelines. So there are things called exercising couch potatoes. <coughs> potatoes. And just because people are out there doing their run and saying, I've done my 150 minutes a week, but if they sit the rest of the time, which they think they do, they are losing a considerable amount of that. Unless you are doing more than 200 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity per week, um, sitting for more than seven hours a day will be, have a negative impact on your health. So even the exercisers that you see out there, most of them aren't doing 200 minutes um, a week. So everybody should be less sedentary, even the people who think they're quite active. So everybody's in this game. That's 70% of the population. So luckily, I met um, through the cardiac rehab world. We're almost there, Pauline. Um, um, Stephanie Prince uh, through the cardiac, and Jennifer, who are in Ottawa. And um, they showed that when it came to physical activity reporting in Canada, people when asked how much activity they do, they doubled what they actually did. So we said, well, we're measuring people's sedentary time at work, so let's put accelerometers on them and ask them. And so we looked at this, uh, we did a systematic review, and so it has 55,000 participants in it that, that where people did self-report and wore accelerometers, and people under-reported their sitting time by 104 minutes a day. So again, when we, when we look at our data, uh, and, and Stephanie's PhD in Canada basically said that, you know, they said 60% of the country is active. No, she says, no, they're not, because they're all telling you that they're doing twice as much than they actually do. So this is worrying. Now, this was a study. It was a very interesting MRES student, Kath Barton, a neurophysio uh, interested in pediatrics and from mid-Wales, who goes out to... Kenya to work with children with cerebral palsy, and they helped the local people build um, frames out of paper mache um, so that these children with cerebral palsy can have uh, good posture, so at least they have some sort of social contact that they can sit up, they can eat, they can socialize with people. And it, it, it really pains you when you think about it. This poor person would do anything to have some postural muscles, just to have a normal social life. And yet, we are quite happy to ruin our postural muscles on a regular basis because of the lifestyles we lead. And we don't have to do much. Just get on your feet and, and use your postural muscles could make a huge difference because there are poor people who don't even have the pleasure of those postural muscles. So that's, that's what hit home to me with this study that um, I was able to supervise her MRES for. So finally, we've got rehabilitation. Um, I struggle, it, it fits, falls between these two things. Um, the World Health Organization has defined rehabilitation in 1993 as required influence favorably the underlying cause of the disease as well as to provide the best possible physical, mental, and social conditions so that patients by their own efforts, and it's quite interesting, people in rehabilitation take charge of people and tell them what to do. And then the rehabilitation ends and things fall apart because their therapist can't see them anymore. And so this is all, a, the focus back then was you need to think about the process of rehabilitation, about helping people help themselves. That is the biggest uh, thing that you can do to help people or, or help those around them to be part of that. We shouldn't be so precious that we want to control people's lives. It's very it's very rewarding to exercise somebody for six weeks and see their function improve, but what happens after you get discharged? So um, this whole issue of rehabilitation um, is a process that is, has a beginning and an end, but what happens at the end um, of that? So the changing nature of rehabilitation, and, and for me, this is cardiac disease, it isn't just cardiac rehabilitation anymore either, because in coronary heart disease, 30% of the participants that come along have diabetes, almost 20% of arthritis, 10% have can cancer, 10%. So I've got a 
deal with these things as well and improve those things. And maybe if I improve these things, they'll be able to be more active. Heart failure, again. So we're dealing with not single issues. So I'm into cardiac rehabilitation. No, I'm into long-term management of chronic disease, because if you've got one of these, you've probably got lots of others. So we ha always have to consider. So training people for this thing called rehabilitation is much more difficult because people are living longer and they've got so many other complications that we have to deal with so that we're, we have a good load. So with the guys in Canada, we produce this guideline for exercising cardiac patients with diabetes and um, most recently the recent uh, textbook for cardiovascular prevention and rehab, which came out in 2020. So looking to the future here at Keel, some of the things that I'm interested in, the efficacy of remote monitoring because of COVID, getting patients to do stuff on their own. And Sam and I were in the lab testing out this device that we want. It's a power meter. It tells you how much power people are using when they're walking or running. Can we use it on patients with cardiac, cancer, pulmonary disease? And this, these are um, devices that will monitor your breathing frequency. For too long, we've been just spending time measuring people's heart rate and not breathing frequency. So we're looking at the importance of breathing frequency as a means of monitoring, because 30% of those cardiac patients have atrial fibrillation, so I can't use their heart rate to exercise them. So, but, and breathing is the most important thing to people. I'm on a puff. Are you breathless? And we don't measure it physiologically in the real world. Well, everybody's got their 250-pound Garmin, and it tells you your heart rate, it actually tells you your breathing frequency on it as well. But there's no evidence to support the use of that yet. So we've, we've, um, we're working on that. So that's the end of this. The best doctor going is always Dr. Seuss. Um, and here is his treadmill test. You're in pretty good shape for the shape you're in. I really like this because it's a, it's, a, it's a very patient-focused behavioral approach that start from where you are. Don't worry what you aren't and let's try and improve you from where you are here and now, because you can't do anything about what's gone before. Thank you very much.